Um, my name is David Walker. I'm a researcher here in the Social Development Program. Um, one word I haven't heard a lot this evening is children. Um, and I'm thinking about, because we know that children are technically part of the cohort from 15 to 24. Um, so we're, we know that there's obviously going to be certain interests that parallel and diverge with regards to children and youth. But as, as we go ahead towards this post-2015 agenda, where are the kind of connections between the, the, the youth campaigns, the youth strategies for promoting, you know, different campaigns in uh, the that are youth fo that are youth focused and that are child focused? How can we begin to either look at take a stock of our situation now and look retrospectively and say, okay, the youth groups have been working along this avenue and the child groups have been working along another avenue. What can we take and what can we learn from that for kind of future enterprises that are post 2015? Or is there an, is there an opportunity okay. now for us to kind of make connections between those groups? Okay, thank you. I'm going to take a couple of other questions, and I want a gender mix, please. Um, okay, <laughs> you go first, please. Um, sorry, the, the lady. <laughs> I'm going to be very strict about this, just along the way, and then you can come. Sorry. <laughs> Um, hello, my name is uh, Beatrice Mosello. I'm uh, from ODI in the climate change and environment team. Um, but I used to be involved for a long time <laughs> in uh, youth movements, especially in relation to the climate change negotiations. And uh, I remember I was in Copenhagen in 2010, and uh, we were very engaged and uh, discussing. And my question is, uh, uh, what do you do with the young people that are not engaged and uh, they are not interested in uh, participating in this discussion? Um, how do you involve them? How do you create the critical mass so that um, we're all speaking the same language? Thank you. Thank you. And then the gentleman along the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name's uh, Tim Crocker Buquet. Uh, I'm a doctor by background. I'm currently working at the Global Health Policy Unit at QMUL, and uh, I'm the director of an organization called Generation Development, which some of you guys will have been familiar with. Um, thank you all for your talks, all very, very interesting. Uh, glad to get a range of perspectives. I was particularly, uh, I'd like to thank the guy for the first question, because actually the clarification between children and youth has become very blurred, and there's actually a very large distinction between issues that affect children who are dependent largely on their parents and issues who affect young people who are no longer dependent on their parents. And the bridges between youth and adulthood, which is a very fuzzy bridge, uh, is much easier to bridge than the gap between children and youth, which is a problem. Um, now, Generation Development, uh, we are an organization that have been going since about 2010. We have um, 16 partner organizations in countries all around the world with young leaders who use their networks of organizations uh, to feed back into various of these different post-2015 processes. Uh, it's been quite an adventure uh, working on it. Ultimately, what we found, though, largely, is that issues that are important to young people as youth are generally issues that are important to everybody. Uh, it's difficult to make uh, any of these things not applicable to older adults or vulnerable older people as well. I think it's important to try and uh, distinguish exactly what it is that the youth voice wants from all of this. So is that, um, is that your question? Can, <laughs> I'm going to encourage people to frame a question that we can respond to. So my question, uh, if you want to do it that way, is um, <laughs> the, what the difficulty with these things are is they're very fuzzy and everyone else will come up with these ideas. What are the specific things that you think we should be advocating for within the youth agenda? We've got our idea and we've written a set of goals. I'd love to get your feedback on it from our website. Um, but what are your ideas of specifically what you think we should be doing? Thank you very much. Okay, so the way we're going to do this is to um, have another round of questions in a moment. And um, those online can do so through the chat room. Um, but I'm going to invite members of this quite large panel to respond as they at, at will. So who'd like to go first? We have a question about uh, children and young people connections, uh, those young people who are not engaged, and clarification about the specific advocacy agenda. Neva. Um, I'm going to stay with the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so a good set of questions. And I think what I will start off with is just quickly to say something about the young people who are not engaged. I think that showing the way in which participation can have impact and influence is essential so that it's not just consultation for consultation's <laughs> sake. I think young people are quite disillusioned globally with, or at least uh, in certain parts of the world, with the way that they see governance structures operating. So actually showing that 
possibility for young people to implement change is, is essential. Um, and I think that there's quite a lot to be done in ensuring that we don't just speak a kind of very specific language that doesn't appeal to other people. Um, I'm going to talk on behalf of the Beyond 2015 campaign and our approach to uh, creating um, kind of priorities for the post-2015 framework in response to the third question from Tim. And I'm sure that every organisation involved in this debate is going to put forward a set of goals. And I think one of the challenges that we have as civil society is actually how do you work out what is important and separate the wheat from the chaff. So what Beyond 2015 as a global campaign has done is use the idea of the vision, the purpose, the values and the criteria through which the framework should be decided. So that we're not essentially just all fighting for that space, but that we've found a way to work together and agree on what the most coherent priorities are. So I'd actually invite you to go to the Beyond 2015 website and have a look at that phrase. <laughs> Some heavy promotion going on here. <laughs> Paula. Can I, I'll, I'll just say something. We do a lot of research in, in the social development team also on children's issues and also across other generations. And I think it's very important to see a continuum of development. And there was some more emphasis in the MDGs on children in terms of the issues that came on the agenda in terms of child mortality, um, access universal access to primary education. Obviously, there's a lot to be said about what they achieved uh, positively, but also negatively in terms of not addressing necessarily the most marginalized and sort of not accounting for inequality, some of these issues you m may, may be aware of. But, but, but it's important also to think that it's, it's, there is a transition, and as, as young people now, many of which have gone through universal primary education, have no, nothing to aspire to after they conclude that. And so I think it's important to, to think about issues on youth and adolescence uh, in terms of ensuring that there's opportunities and things for young people to aspire to uh, and, and to continue progressing and, and, and ensuring that, that, that there is still a, a focus on, on, on survival and primary health, but also on preventive health as young people move to adolescence. And, uh, and something that we found um, in, in doing the, uh, the research for this project is that sometimes um, these issues are not necessarily looked at from different uh, sub-cohorts, so children and youth seem fragmented, but actually there's um, as David and I think Tim were saying, a lot of overlap between issues. Um, I mean, um, a, a girl in, in Uganda might at 12 might be seen as a, an adult because she had a menstruation and is ready to be married. Mm -hmm. And the issues that are relevant for her at that stage are more similar <coughs> to those of a 20 or 25 year old in another country. So it's important to understand the context in which children and youth are living and see those from um, and the policy and programmatic approaches that seem relevant for addressing those points. So definitely looking at that diversity as well. Mm. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll move on unless there's any other responses uh, to that round. Just yes, um, just, uh, uh, just to keep it short, I won't respond on the children one, but I do, yeah, I agree with what Paolo was saying. Um, on the kind of the specific recommendations, this is definitely something that came up in, in the first stage of the consultations, but I think we were, we wanted to be quite, quite realistic with what we could do in a first round, and we really recognised where the conversation was at at that time, and it was really important that as a youth sector we could say what the overarching priorities for youth were, um, and what we're doing now in the kind of second stage, and as the global process moves to the second stage, is working with partners against you know submitting new bids for funding, etc., to be able to then work with partners at the national level to get specific because it is very it's very technical and it, it can be quite inaccessible, and it's often just you know um, reserved for the kind of policy wonk type kind of young person and that's great we need young people like that but only those people who will sit on listservs and will spend hours poring over a document and what we want to do is to be running you know activities at the national level that make it accessible almost to an extent that the people in the workshop don't even know that they're talking about policy recommendations mm -hmm. but but what we're doing is supporting them to think through the really specific bits that enables us to talk about targets and indicators great thank you very much right uh, another round of questions Yep, somebody over here, and then a lady here, and then a gentleman here. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Tom Palmer. I'm from Leonard Cheshire Disability. Um, I just wanted to quickly thank uh, Millicent for raising the important issue of including children, uh, youth with dis disabilities in the consultations. Um, and a really quick question to Victoria, whether perhaps she could 
talk a little bit about the specific measures you took to encourage your partners to include youth with disabilities in your consultations. Thanks very much. Hi, good evening. My name is Gina Ciceroni from the LSE and also a founder of a youth organization in Ecuador, ICY Ecuador. So Paola, in the report you had mentioned that youth are involved in precarious employment and also NAVA going along the lines of the capability approach and giving them uh, the capabilities and looking at human dignity. So I was wondering, one of the key areas for investment in the report was entrepreneurship and you have a lot of programs that are emerging in developing countries. But as an entrepreneur in a developing country myself, there were a lot of time restrictions and money restrictions, you know, whether it be 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 dollars to have to start an organization. So I think what you see is a lot of organizations being started by youth in the informal economy. And with that said, is that not leading to this almost continuous cycle about continued precarious employment? And if so, what can be done to stop that cycle if they're coming from above in these government restrictions? Thank you. Thank you very much. David Wilkham, uh, Peace Child International, following on directly from what you were saying. Paula, uh, your report is entitled The Case um, for Investing in Youth, and you're using financial language, words like dividend and up. So I wonder if you can sort of give the elevator speech on the business case, because you have odd um, stacks like the UNESCO statistic on um, return on education, which comes from rather dubious set of figures at the OECD. But if you were stuck in an elevator with Justine Greening, what would be your quick and dirty elevator speech to persuade her that actually investing in youth is going to give the kinds of returns? Because as you may know, Jim Wolfenson, when he was president of the World Bank, made lots of great speeches about the value of investing in youth, but he didn't carry his senior economist with him because he didn't actually have the data, the case to make. So I wonder if uh, you could just briefly summarize that. Okay. That's a challenge. Uh, we'll, we'll give Paula a little time. <laughs> 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 and other people should help with this one because it's a very good question. Okay, so you'd like to go first. Fix, would you like to deal with the disability one? Yeah, sure. No, and thank you for the question. And we were really pleased with the fact that amongst other kind of issues of other groups that have often been excluded, particularly young people with disabilities from the MDGs, that it came up quite strongly in the in the report. Um, and so what we did, we, in, in terms of kind of encouraging diversity, the guidance went out to partners, had um, a whole set of kind of um, suggestions and recommendations about how they could get that diversity. It's not just young people with disabilities, but people living in rural areas, people who were, you know, some organisations were very specifically focused on SRH, so how do you get young people who are also interested in entrepreneurship or who live in the, don't live in the capital city? Um, and a lot of that was how they work in partnership with others, so not expecting organisations to suddenly be able to recruit young people with disabilities to be involved, but how do you partner with other organisations nationally? And I know, obviously, in Kenya, um, but also in the Philippines, that was something they did really well. Um, and again, and obviously just guidance around um, how to make sure space is accessible. Um, I'm sure there's definitely things we could learn on how to make that better, but in the toolkit it does point to kind of a whole kind of range of kind of suggestions on how to make sure it was accessible for a broader group of young people. But as I say, I'm sure there's things we could do better second time round. Great. Pe 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 perhaps well, Paula, and I'm going to encourage Ricardo as well to take the third question. Maybe, um, Neva, you could uh, <laughs> tackle the entrepreneur issue. Yeah, definitely. And you can do that. Sorry. Um, yeah, definitely. It's a really good question. And so I, as well as being involved with Beyond 2015, I work for CAFODS, um, which is developing its own organisational thinking on um, the priorities and that we see for post-2015 development based on our experience of working with <laughs> partners around the world. And one of the areas that's really come through is how do you create a level playing field for micro and small enterprises? Because the restrictions that you talk of are what fundamentally hamper so many people from breaking out of that cycle and um, kind of engaging in kind of equitable economies. And I think that's one thing that a post-2015 framework really can deliver is a more level playing field if it has the right recommendations in terms of the targets and indicators. So it's definitely something that I think can be um, included. I also just want to say a word on the disability, um, which is about one of the ways that we found effective in, post, uh, in Beyond 2015 is through um, very in-depth participatory research as part of Participate that enables people with disabilities to really um, express and identify the barriers and obstacles that they find um, to their own uh, experience of moving out of poverty and um, marginalisation. So I yeah, just wanted to mention that as well. 
Democratic. Thank you very much. So the business case for young people in development. Yeah, so, so I, uh, I'm not surprised that Jay Wolferson didn't have an economist. What he needed was a demographer <coughs> because, uh, because the, the idea of the demographic dividend has been established for a long time. And, 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 and I, I think Paula mentioned it, that the demographic dividend uh, in, in the world is right now at, at its highest or something like that. And, and basically the, the idea of the demographic dividend is that you have a larger share of young people relative to the people you need to, to support, young and old. And, uh, and, and that, that's an important case that, that to, to make that happen, you actually need to, to, to engage in productive activities the young population, you know, the population that can actually generate that dividend. And, and that's, that's the challenge. The challenge because, so as, as we saw, there is a, a huge amount of people uh, uh, unemployed, young people unemployed. I think the economist called, it, called recently the jobless generation and things like that. And that's the real challenge. So, so, so so I hear a lot about the process, but there is something about the system that needs to needs to to be to be thoroughly thought about uh, to to be able to include the, the 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 large numbers of young people across the world into into productive activities. And the other aspect that I I want to highlight is that this this demographic transition is is very different in in ac ac across the world. Mm. So so so. Europe and and, uh, and Japan, for instance, they've already gone through through the demographic transition. But but Africa and Latin America and Asia are going through this, and they're in different stages. So, so so the real question of 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 mobility of labor for young population is also something is also something that needs to be discussed seriously, because as as, um, as some societies will grow older and some societies will will I mean will will be generating all this, this, uh, this number of young people that, uh, that uh, there'll be, I mean, there'll be opportunities to, 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 to generate wealth from, from that. I think that's a pretty, pretty plausible answer. And there's, there's an, there's an opportunity for more engagement afterwards. But uh, Paula, you want to uh, add I'll to I'll that? just, I agree with, with Ricardo's perspective. And I had noted a couple of points that coincided with that, but I, to build on that. I think, first of all, we know that there's insufficient data, and despite multiple agreements to generate disaggregated by, uh, data by gender, age, et cetera, that hasn't happened. And in order to make a stronger business case, there needs to be better data. And there, there's a case in itself to generate that data um, as, to, as to be able to quantify some of these impacts. Uh, and so that's uh, important in itself, but also uh, not only in terms of the economic opportunities, which just by numbers is important if, um, if, if young people are able to contribute to the economy just as much as there has been analysis of adding women to, to many national economies, how they can add to GDP and others, um, just by numbers, young people who are working and contributing rather than uh, being sort of uh, not employed or studying um, or in education. <coughs> and uh, it, it seems quite obvious, but even beyond that, I mean, some of the points that we were trying to make in terms of linkages across the themes that we explore is um, education has a very important impact on public health and on sexual and sexual and reproductive health has an impact on uh, fertility rates, and that in itself uh, in itself has um, an impact on um, if 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 um, in in household livelihood <coughs> strategies and um, and the way people are able to contribute. There's a, a linkage between education uh, uh, and and participation, and then civic en engagement, dem democracy. So. All these areas also um, sometimes are more difficult to quantify, but are also important in terms of the um, economic uh, and, and social dividend that they imply. So it's it's certainly important, and the clearest uh, figures come in the areas of education and and, and work. Um, but uh, <coughs> but th th there is, um, uh, as I was talking about, just in terms of if young people are and and sort of the, the World Bank. When in Cunningham has made some some interesting studies also in terms of violence and youth in Latin America, if violence uh, and attention, greater attention is given to youth in terms of uh, engaging them in in um, uh, in activities that are not necessarily um, um, uh, diverting sort of their activities from from crime and violence, it um, it reduces costs in terms of uh, uh, policing, uh, public health, uh, death. Gone violence, etc. So, so there's many avenues from which to look at this. Thank um, you. Just to go back very briefly to the other point that yeah. 
from Ecuador made um, in terms of, I think it's also important to look at complementary policies. So many young people are, are involved for sure in, in, in the informal economy, and it's very unrealistic to think that there's going to be a transformation for all of them in developing countries to transition to formal economy, but then thinking of social welfare mechanisms, social protection uh, mechanisms that are able to give uh, some support in terms of universal uh, health care, preventive health care, and so on, to complement that, th that um, uh, risky investment that is uh, youth entrepreneurship and ensure that they, they, they can make that risky yeah. investment. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm not getting, to my technical assistance, I'm not getting anything online, if, if uh, that's an issue, so perhaps somebody can help me. So I'd like to get in two more rounds, if possible, um, here and next door, uh, and Katie. Hi there, my name's Christy Lowe, I'm from uh, the Charity Works Graduate Scheme. Um, I was interested to hear if the issue of mobility and um, kind of uh, fluid borders, how that came through um, from the youth consultations, just because I've seen quite from volunteering in Colombia and working with African entrepreneurs, I've seen quite a kind of almost a divide between the um, youth who have, has who have aspirations who really to be international youth and have those opportunities abroad versus youth who actually feel quite strong ties to their specific area and want to see the opportunities built in their own country. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I'm Nishi I'm from Clock Tower International. I'm actually in the process of developing a graduate and MSME um, enterprise in Tanzania. But following on from the graduate scape, not a lot has been said about graduates. Um, a lot, has, a lot of focus is being put on by NGOs and donors, et cetera, on vocational training, education, et cetera. But what about the youth that have gone through the formal education process? How are they going to be interacted and get on the job training? Um, a lot of organizations uh, like the Big Five, et cetera, who are going into developing economies don't tend to recruit locally. And that is a big issue. How are donors going to be engaging with them to get them to recruit locally? Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I was just um, picking up on a couple of things people said. Um, I think there was a lot of mention about how this has been one of the most participatory, participatory UN processes, um, and there's definitely been a lot of noise around that. Um, but then Millie was touching on that kind of difficulty between um, translating UN language um, into how young people respond to that and drawing on that very diverse um, section of young people. So. I guess I was wondering um, what panelists think about whether this has been a kind of transformative participatory process or whether it's just been another kind of token participation exercise. Um, and then following on from that, I guess um, Neva was talking a little bit about what will young people do if their voices are not included in this. And um, I think maybe it becomes a more transformative process when the space for dissent is included um, and, and th is possible. So. I was wondering if panellists had any contributions on where those spaces for dissent might be. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, be preparing your next round and we'll, we'll try and fit them in. Um, perhaps we can take the first one. Who'd like to take mobility and cross-border movements? Was that directed at anybody particularly? The panel in general. Who'd like to take that? Well, this is, I mean, the, the issue around migration, we t t touched upon it briefly on the report, but it's not something we went to. It's one of the, the areas that we would have needed more time to explore in detail. But uh, what is um, what I, uh, something that relates to, the, to the, the other common in terms of opportunities in their own countries and graduates? I think that this is a, a, a real area of uh, debate at the moment in terms of you know how you channel young people who have completed degrees to areas that are... Um, that are opening up the economy, for example, through trade agreements uh, that might uh, increase new avenues of, um, okay. of, of income and, and growth. Obviously, the green economy being one of the, the, the clear ones. So uh, more than, than solutions, that w we we're definitely saying that, that there's more sort of work that donors can make as knowledge brokers with the private sector in countries to understand what are the capacity, the specific capacities that are, are needed and how to offer retraining or um, or, or, or refocus of, of areas of, of graduates in, in specific countries to, to go towards those areas. Thank you. Millicent. <laughs> okay, my comment would be that um, the interest is there for mobility across borders. I think the reason it came out not 
as high as other issues is that there's more problems internally. I don't know if this makes sense. Like, fix the problem at home first before thinking of going away. Um, the interest is there, yes, but there are issues that are more pressing at the moment. This is what I got from the consultation. So uh, democratic issues, social injustices, opportunities for employment at home. Like in East Africa, the East African community is now open. Like I can work in Rwanda, Burundi, all these places, but the other issues that are more pressing <coughs> are the ones that came out first. It's not that the interest isn't there. Mm. Thank you. Okay, the um, question about um, uh, graduates. Does anybody want to add to that question? It's a good question, but inclusion. I, think, uh, I mean, I, I've only got a really brief point, um, which is that a lot of the um, language that I've heard being used is now about lifelong learning and making sure that training and um, education is appropriate to the uh, context in which that education is received. But I'm afraid that it's not a particular area of my knowledge of things. Well, I was just going to say very briefly, it's not something I'm working on directly, but I know um, as an organisation restless development in a couple of our country programmes in Uganda and I think Sierra Leone are kind of just kicking off new kind of public, private um, uh, government partnerships um, with, to, with a view just to doing that, with placing graduates within kind of uh, the private sector um, and in government institutions and things as well. Um, I'm, I don't work on it directly, but I know that kind of, um, yeah, it's something that we're increasingly focused on and kind of piloting and testing and learning from to see how effective it is. Um, can I just touch briefly on the, mm, the, the, the point that Katie raised about um, kind of space for dissent and I'm sure that um, Neva potentially <laughs> have something to say on that as well. Um, I suppose it's just it's that question isn't it what, what is the U what, what is the UN space fit for as well and does the UN space provide you know and um, the opportunity for that I wasn't at the Rio conference but I know that there was a, a kind of a noisy but peaceful kind of protest on the last day when it was clear that despite the kind of months of consultation and the very what was seen to be a very effective process there was nothing of that included and the the people who did walk out peacefully but noisily where essentially their UN passes were taken away that you know and as a result people don't feel that that the space the UN is fit for that that purpose and so if it's not and if we think still that peaceful protest and kind of you know being able to kind of um, disagree in ways that aren't just disagreeing over text that's very kind of elitist in a way you have to be quite highly engaged, quite highly educated to understand a UN text and know what you disagree with and then know how to communicate that. So, so yeah, how do we better make processes like the post-2015 process, which are still quite, again, kind of inaccessible. Is this really relevant to me? I'm not interested in development or am I? How do we make that kind of engaging so that when, if the results that come out aren't kind of reflective, aren't transfer, you know, don't bring us transformation. Yeah, what, what happens? I don't have the answer. But I don't know if Neva wants to comment. Yeah, I mean, this is like for me my kind of um, <laughs> ideal question. If anyone wants to talk about this over a drink afterwards, um, <coughs> I can go on for a long time. Um, I wouldn't say it's the most, uh, it's been defined as the most participatory UN process, but the most consultative. And I think that there is a fundamental difference between the two. I was going to bring up Rio plus 20, but Vix has already touched on that. But I think the questions that the UN are facing, the UN is facing it if you're taking it as like one body is what is the purpose and who has the right to engage in the multilateral process. Um, so I think it is a really interesting time, particularly looking at um, the kind of political context in which the post-2015 development framework is being discussed. One thing that I would say is that time and again, beyond 2015 and civil society globally, here's the message. Can civil society just provide us with one clear, coherent message on post-2015, which is absolutely calling for the limitation of disagreement and um, kind of contested spaces. And I think really it's on the UK government and the high level panel and the UN system to accept the fact that there will be a diversity of different voices and perspectives put forward. You're talking about one of the most complex agendas and when you're asking people from around the world who have very different experiences of what is important to poverty and marginalization and exclusion, they're going to put forward different points of view um, and saying that it's just a Christmas tree is frankly <laughs> cutting people out. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. Now, yeah, Millicent, please. Thank you. All right. Um, Katie, I like that you asked 
was it just another consultation process? So I won't speak any UN language, but just from our experience at VSO Digital Aid, no, it was not. It was a really, really good process for us. Um, number one, because we focus on working with young people, um, encouraging them to participate in development, whether it's through discussion or decision making, implementation, the fact that we reached out to them before the post-2015 discussion or draft comes through is really big for us. So no, it wasn't just another <laughs> discussion. Um, number two, at the end of the consultation, something that came out really clearly in Kenya is that there was lack of awareness of the current MDGs. So there was that gap. How do we fulfill something that we don't even know exists? So for us, we are certain we are on the right track through this process. Thank you very much indeed. Now, um, I'm afraid we're, we're out of time, um, but the good news is that I would like to invite you all to join us for drinks and nibbles so you can ask more questions then. Um, I'm really pleased that Millicent, Millicent had the last uh, word in this. Um, uh, as our young person representative, although I think I'm surrounded by lots of young people, actually. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I, I'd like to, to, to bring this to an end and, and, and thank you all very, very much for a, a very uh, stimulating uh, discussion. Thank you for the input. Thank you for the response. Thank you for your questions. Um, I'm really sorry that we didn't have anything from those watching online, but there we go. Um, another, another time, another day. Um, I'd like to just... Uh, thank uh, uh, a few people, Hannah Adler and Catriona Webster from ODI um, uh, for, for their help and, and Hannah Smith at Restless Development um, and Tom Burke who's my colleague from YCARE International for, for all the uh, input and thought in this uh, extended process. Um, and uh, also I, I feel uh, a vote of thanks to DFID for support for, the, for all of this is ap appropriate too. So thank you very, very much indeed. I'd like to just remind you that the um, event has been videoed and, and recorded um, for audio uh, and will be available on the ODR website within 48 hours. Uh, so the documents uh, are outside. Please help yourselves and please let's keep this discussion going. Thank you very much indeed.